stage here this morning. I have to get used to everything. I want to welcome everyone to the services this morning, especially want to welcome any visitors we may have, and just ask if you fill out the tab on the side of the bulletin, drop it in the offering plate. Uh, if you are a first-time visitor, we want to welcome you with a special gift bag we've arranged, but we'll need you to raise your hand up really high at this time, and somebody will get that to you. For his announcements today, I was asked to announce uh, the Branches drama meeting that was scheduled for today, that has been rescheduled for next Sunday. So uh, probably get your bulletin look next Sunday, or I'll announce it next Sunday, what time it is next Sunday. Uh, also, I did have a flyer that was given to me. Uh, it's an account that's been set up for uh, Freddie Gann and his wife, Kimberly Gann. And I'll lay this back here on the table after church today. Uh, they was involved in uh, a DUI accident, a uh, drunk driver hidden, and they've got some medical expenses, and there is an account set up at the Bank of Salem. I was asked to if I could announce that today, and I'll lay that back there on the table. Also, uh, if you're part of the nominating committee, uh, I'd like to have a quick meeting right after uh, services this morning. If you're here, uh, just right up front here, we have a couple things we need to discuss. I think that's all I have today. Do we have any birthdays this past week? Birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. Anniversaries. I know Buzz and Kathy had a 50-year anniversary. There you go. They had a 50-year anniversary. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary, God bless you. Happy anniversary to you. My word from the word for today, October 12th, is from first cut off there. First John verses 7 through 10. Well, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day you've blessed us with, Father. Another day we can gather together here at your house to worship you and sing praises unto you, Father. And Father, I come to you at this time knowing there's many that's not here for whatever the reason. I know there's some that's ill, Father. There's some that's battling cancer. Uh, there's some that's just traveling, Father. It's out of place. And I just pray that you just be with each and every one of them and let your will be done in their lives. And we just pray that they'll return back to your house here once again. We pray that you just bless the rest of the service. You bless Brother John's. He brings a message from your word. You'll bless this skit that they're preparing to give, and you'll bless our choir and Sister Pam. We just pray that you just guide and lead and direct us each and every day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Long before 
before the dawn, before the rooster has his say. The farmer and the farmer's wife begin another day. She will wash the dishes and he will milk the cows. And like every spring for forty years, it's time to hitch the plow. Now he knows every furrow like the back of his hand. Somehow they made a living by living off the land. It ain't nothing fancy. It don't look like much to some, but these fields can feed a family before the winters come. Four thirty-nine harvest times, the farmer's wife has prayed. Let the man she's always loved would go to church with her one day, but he's as stubborn as the mule. That helps him work the summer fields. She prays for grace and prays for rain and the crops that they will yield. Now no one knows what's going on inside an old man's head. But one October Sunday morn, he got out of bed and he put on his coat and tie and he polished up his. The farmer joined the farmer's wife together on the pier. That little congregation, they won't forget the day that he walked to the altar and he knelt down to pray. And like the leaves on the trees, the tears began to fall. The seeds that she had planted had been growing after all. Forty harvest times, forty crops that they had grown. Forty years of Sundays, she went to church alone. But she won't see the autumn leaves the same way anymore. October harvest she's been waiting for. If you have a little faith before you sow that seed below, you'll see it grow. See it grow, yes, grow, grow. Forty harvest times, forty crops that they. Sunday, she went to church alone. But she won't see the autumn leaves the same way anymore. It's the October harvest she's been waiting for. It's the October harvest. Bye. 
Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood in the soul? Stand with us. We're going to do our praise and worship DVD. Holy, 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 I want to 
Well, that was a treat. We uh, have Bertie Claire here today. Where is Bertie at? Where? Stand up. <laughs> Candy and Ryan and Bertie Claire. Amen. <laughs> Glad to have Bertie Claire in church. God bless you guys. We're praying for you. Have I, are there any other babies that are here? I missed them the last week they were here. Any other new babies? All right. <clears throat> we were so close yesterday. So close. I'm going to put that in the offering plate. <laughs> I appreciate you remembering that, hon. Uh, we spoke for four weeks, five weeks, about friendship. And I was wondering what to follow that up with and, and thinking about it because my thought during that series of messages were, was this primarily, show me your friends and I'll show you your future, Proverbs thirteen twenty, And so I thought about that and I thought, well, I'm just going to preach a message about wisdom because I think every single one of us need a good dose of wisdom. And probably in Scripture, the wisest man that we come across was Solomon. He made some horrible mistakes, did some foolish things. But I suppose my favorite encounter with Solomon is his encounter with God. When he was going to make him the next king, he said to Solomon, Ask what you will and I'll give it to you. A blank check. Now, Solomon responds by saying, give me wisdom to judge the people correctly. I'm thinking, I wonder what I would have asked for. Would I have asked for things, power, prestige, prominence, position, what would I have asked for? Would I ask for wealth untold, servants? I don't know. But I've thought about that, so I decided to bring this message to you today out of Ecclesiastes chapter 9, my favorite Old Testament book, and I want you to stand with me. We're going to look at verse 14 and 15, but verse 14 says, There was a little city with few men in it, That's almost like Salem. And a great king came against it, besieged it, and built great snares around it. Let's go ahead and put verse 15 up there as well. And verse 15 says, Now there was found in it a poor, wise man, and he by wisdom delivered the city, yet no one remembered that same Poor man. Father, I pray that you would bless the reading of your word. And I pray, Lord, that we might simply seek you, recognizing the power that is in wisdom. And I know, Lord, wisdom isn't always recognized in its time, but help us to recognize it. And I pray today that each of us might evaluate our lives and we would walk in wisdom and we would walk in the right direction with the right people and that we might walk with you and I pray that you would protect us in Christ's name I pray amen 
Now, there's, the first thing I want to share with you is the recognition of wisdom, and I'll just be very brief about this because wisdom isn't always recognized in its time. What is wise isn't always seen as wise. And what I often tell people is be careful about your evaluations of something because your present evaluation may not be your best evaluation. Sometimes we have a tendency to say, this is really good, too early to tell. This is really bad, too early to tell. We don't know. So what we need to do is take a step back get a little bit of time between this thing and a little bit of distance and then give a correct evaluation at that point. In this case, there was a wise man who delivered a city with his wisdom. They followed his plan, yet they did not follow him. So wisdom does have its advantages, as Solomon put it it in verse 17 and 18. He says, words... Of the wise spoken quietly. I like how that says that. Quietly. Not shouting them. Should be heard. Rather than the shout of a ruler of fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war. But one sinner. Destroys much good. One person can destroy so much and one person can build up so much wisdom gives us the ability to say the right thing and to do the right thing now I know that many of you know my favorite president it's President Lincoln I I love to read about President Lincoln Washington's a close second But those are my favorite presidents. But historians tell us that that great speech that that Lincoln gave at Gettysburg wasn't always seen as wise. In fact, at the time that it was given, there was harsh criticism concerning that speech and the content of that speech. So when Lincoln gave the Gettysburg Address, one minute and 58 seconds... The London Times said, rendering ludicrous what otherwise might have been an impressive ceremony. In Harrisburg, which was 35 miles away, the editor of the Harrisburg paper said, we pass over the silly remarks of the president, and for the credit of the nation, we ask that the veil of oblivion fall over those words that they never be uttered again. Wisdom is not always seen as wise in its time. There was a silver-tongued orator that spoke two hours that day, and I would guess there are probably one, maybe two people in this building that know who that was. But everybody has heard and has heard quoted the Gettysburg Address. Listen, wisdom doesn't always seem wise in its time, but what we need to do is evaluate what is said and what is done and then take a step back and look at it with more clarity before we say good or evil. Give a, get a little time between it. Give a little distance for it. Now there's a second thing that I want you to see. Not only the recognition of wisdom, but I want you also to see the second thing, and that's what wisdom does. Here are things that wisdom does. So let me pause for just a moment here. Now, Your friends, what they're doing may seem wise when you're young. Take a step back, peer over your shoulder, ask your parents, is this wise? They're probably going to give you a different set of eyes to see that and probably a few different words to say, unwise. Don't do that. It will hurt you. So be real cautious about what you do and be sure that you bank on wisdom. But some things that wisdom does, and I'm going to give you a handful. I I think five, six, seven. I don't even know how many I'll give you. But here's what wisdom does. Wisdom results in righteousness. In Ecclesiastes 10 and verse 2, it said, A wise man's heart 
is at his right hand, but a fool's heart is at his left. Now, biblically speaking, the right hand was the hand of authority. It was the hand of power. It was the hand of righteousness. And, and, and what wisdom does, it manifests itself in righteousness. Solomon, say, Solomon says, stay to the right. Stay with wisdom. Now, as we go through life, there are many philosophies that are calling out for you. These philosophies are saying, follow me. Follow me. I'm the way to truth. I'm the way to life. I'm the way to peace. I'm the way to prosperity. Follow me. There is a philosophy of the ancient Socrates. And Socrates said, what you need to do in life, to enjoy life, to understand life, you simply need to know yourself. You need to get in touch with who you are. Once you get in touch with who you are, then you'll be able to enjoy life. There is a grain of truth in that. We should know who we are, but we should know who we are in light of who He is. And once we recognize who He is, then we understand better who we are, and then we can make a proper evaluation of what we should do. Now, there is a philosophy of Epicurus. Epicurus says what you need to do is just throw restraint to the wind. You need to enjoy yourself, live it up, go for the gusto, no bonds, nothing holds you back. You want to do it, you do it. Just live life as you want to. You show me a person that lives life like that, that never has anything restraining them, and I'll show you a person that's headed for heartache. You don't need to live your life simply indulging yourself with that Epicurean philosophy of just enjoy yourself. Whatever you want to do, you just do it because it's okay. And then there is the philosophy of Sigmund Freud. You talk about, I mean, just take a look at that guy. Wouldn't you like to go to him for counseling? I wouldn't even want to go into his room, much less lie on his couch. He just says what you need to do. If you'll just discipline yourself, as you discipline yourself, you're going to be successful at life. Discipline will only take you so far. If you're disciplined in the right areas, good. If you're disciplined in the wrong areas, bad. So discipline will only take you so far. And then Jesus comes along with this philosophy. Jesus said, you know what? It's not enough to know yourself. It's not enough to indulge yourself. It's not enough to discipline yourself. What you need to do is give yourself. And as you give yourself for the work of the kingdom of God, and you give yourself to God, and you give yourself to others, then and only then are you going to find peace, that passes all understanding. And as we give ourselves, listen, wisdom will result in righteousness when we follow the right path. But not only that, wisdom also results in composure. Look at verse 4. If the spirit of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your post, for conciliation pacifies great offenses. Listen, what you need to do when God has called you to a particular area of your life that you are to work and you are to fulfill, don't run from it. Stand fast. Do what God has called you to do. And wisdom will result in composure. Now listen, here's what I mean by that. Many people have short fuses. And they overreact to every provocation of life. I mean, you say something to them and just... You know what I mean? I mean, they, they just are, are just a, they're just a ball of energy. Like, oh, can somebody says, I'm going to explode. And they do. And they just explode constantly. Every provocation, short views, they just get so angry. Throw up their hands. I'm going to not do this ever again. And they, uh, fight every opposition, they want to fight about it. They don't want to take a step back. They don't want to analyze it. They just want to fight. But wisdom will help you discern when it's right to fight and when it's right to hold your anger and not do those things. It will help you know when it's right to speak up and when it's right to shut up. Wisdom teaches us there are some battles that could be won, but they're not worth fighting. Kind of like the old hunter 
The old hunter said, my dog can catch a skunk anytime it wants, but it just ain't worth it. <laughs> There's some things that just aren't worth it. You'll smell worse for doing it. Stay away. Wisdom also will manifest itself or result in efficiency. Look at verses 8, 9, and 10. And these are people who lack wisdom. It says, he who dig, digs a pit will fall into it. This man digs a pit. He's not careful. He falls in and he injures himself. Whoever breaks through a wall will be bitten by a serpent. Here's the guy. I mean, if you were bitten by a serpent, you just knew death was imminent. Here's a man who's just, who's just going about his work, not paying any attention, breaks through a wall, serpent bites him. He's going to lose his life. He who quarries stones may be hurt by them. If you've ever quarried stones, and I've not done it, you don't do it like this. <laughs> not a wise way to quarry stones because the stone will fall on you and take your life or injure you very badly. He who splits, this one you guys might understand. Some of you older people that have split a little bit of wood. He who splits wood may be endangered by it. You ever been hurt splitting wood? Yep, sure have. And by the way, if you have split wood, if the axe is dull and one does not sharpen the edge, then you must use more strength. But wisdom brings success. Now, if you've ever cut wood with an axe or even with a saw, you know it needs to be sharp. If it's not sharp, you're going to work harder and produce less. But once you sharpen that, it takes fewer blows or less time, and then you have better results. Each person that we have here is working harder when they need to work smarter. You ever been guilty of that? I mean, you're working really, really hard, but your production is way down. You know what you need to do? Work smarter. Work smarter. Kind of reminds me of the old woodcutter. This guy could swing an axe like nobody's business. I mean, he was impressive. And, and, and he could go out, he could just slay a tree. I mean, he would take it down, cut it up, stack it up, and it would be ready to go to market. I mean, he was impressive. And, and down at the, the mill, this, this, the mill owner thought, you know, if I could get that guy to work for me as hard as he works, put a chainsaw in his hand, I could get rich. So he hires the man. The man comes to work for him. He goes out into the yard to cut up a few trees. A couple hours later, the, the owner goes out and says, you know what, I can't wait to see what he's accomplished. He goes out. He'd given him a brand new steel chainsaw. He'd been out there a few hours. He goes out there. There is one rick of wood cut. The man is on the ground. He's laying down on his back, panting, sweating profusely. The owner says, what happened? The man gets to his knees. He said, I want my axe back. He said, you want your axe back? He said, this thing's terrible. The owner looked at it, pulled the cord, and it goes, Broom. The old man said, what's that noise? <laughs> Sometimes we work really hard, but we don't work so smart. What we need to do is learn to work smarter. And as we work smarter, we have more results and fewer pain. Now, we need to be efficient. Now, let me just uh, share another one with you in verse 12. This is wisdom. Wisdom results in graciousness. Watch what he said. The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious. You know what that says? You'll be kind. You'll say the right thing. You, 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 you're just giving out goods. But the lips of a fool shall swallow him up. A fool always mouths off, always has something to say. He is curt in his comments, cutting in his reply. Everything he or she says is always demeaning and discouraging and beating people up because they don't know how to treat people 
right. Listen, but a gracious person knows what to say and how to say it and when to say it, and they say it at the right time. In Proverbs 18, it says in verse 6, A fool's lips enter into contention, and his mouth calls for blows. Listen, a wise man is out there and he's saying the right thing. A fool is always saying the wrong thing and always getting beaten up because of it. Listen, we need to learn to keep our mouth shut sometimes. Wisdom will help you with that. Wisdom also results in discipline. In verse 17, watch what it says. Blessed are you, O land, when your king is the son of nobles. And your princes feast at the proper time. They do it for strength and not for drunkenness. This is a person whose life is under control. Now, I don't know about you, but I just don't enjoy being around someone whose life is out of control. Everything is an emergency and everything is emotional. I like someone that gets on the road and they're pretty steady as she goes. They think through what they're going to say and what they're going to do, how they're going to act and how they're going to react. And they don't let little things cause them to blow up and make bad decisions. Every act of our life when we submit ourselves to wisdom will be under control. Have you ever felt foolish for saying the wrong thing at the wrong time? You ever put your foot in your mouth? Let me tell you what I did. I have done a lot of funerals. And you know, some families look alike. The people look alike. I've got a couple brothers. We kind of look alike. Well, I saw a guy I hadn't seen in a long time. I had, uh, didn't, I didn't remember. I knew I'd buried a family member, but I couldn't remember if it was his dad or his uncle. It had been a while. I saw him and I said, hey, and I just happened to see his uncle the day before, but I didn't know it was his uncle. I thought it was his dad. I said, hey, I saw your dad yesterday. His face went ashen. I immediately recognized I'd said the wrong thing. He said, my dad's been dead for four years. You buried him. I said, I'm so sorry. He said, it must have been my uncle. I said, probably was. Have you ever done that? I mean, maybe not that one, but have you ever done something really foolish you didn't mean to say it but you said it and once you said it you wanted to grab the words stuff them back down your throat and not let them out but you did it and you couldn't get it back wrong thing wrong place wrong time sometimes wrong person wisdom keeps us from doing that because a wise person is one whose life is under control wisdom manifests itself in a controlled life Now, wisdom also results in sharing. You see, some people, all they want to do is have and hoard. Look at chapter 11, verse 1. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. And you could keep reading, give a portion to 7 and to 8. He's talking about what you do with your money and what you do with your life. You need to take your portfolio and not put all your eggs in one basket. You need to put a little here and a little here and a little here and a little here. It's not good enough just to put it all between the mattresses or bury in the yard. You need to diversify. You need to diversify. Put a little here and put a little there. But unfortunately, most people, their philosophy is this. Get all you can, can all you get, sit on the lid and poison the rest. I'm going to make sure nobody else gets anything that I have. It is all mine. you know anybody like that? I mean, they are miserable. And, and they want, they, all they want to do is set up at night counting their money. I've got more money than them. I may be miserable, but I've got more money. How foolish is that? How foolish is that? Listen, everything that we have is going to be gone. Everything that we keep We can't keep. Somebody else is going to own it. Hey, go back and look at the deed of your land. The land that you own, somebody else owned it before you, and somebody else will own it when you're gone. We get to be caretakers, and that's about it. You know, some people feel like uh, in life that it's just a game of accumulating things. They don't realize that 
in the rat race of life. Even if you accumulate more than everybody else, the winner is still a rat. You can't keep it. Oh, one of my friends, his brother, has worked on Wall Street for years and years and years. He's now, I don't know if they call them CEOs or whatever they call them. He was in Morgan Stanley and he was a, on their board of Morgan Stanley. He decided he was going to retire and somebody threw him a bone that he could run their corporation. You know what he makes? His annual salary before bonuses? $7.2 million. <laughs> what do you do with $7.2 million? <laughs> I don't have any idea. But you know, all I could think about is so, <laughs> so, is that going to make you happy? And then he went on to tell me, my friend went on to tell me, he said, he goes up to a cabin every week because he and his wife are so miserable. He goes to get away from her. <laughs> and I'm sure that she's glad he's gone because she wants to be away from him. What good is it? What good is it? I'm thinking, my goodness. You know, a wise man knows what's important in life. One of my favorite stories of all time is the story of Maxie Jarman. Maxie Jarman was in Nashville, Tennessee. He had a shoe and apparel company. And in the 1960s, he was a billionaire. He started his company from his family with 75 employees. And at its height, he had 75,000 people working for him. That's a lot of people. But Maxie was a Christian. And Maxie gave money to build schools, to build churches, for mission work, for libraries, for colleges, for institutions. He just gave and he gave and he gave. And if anybody remembers the 70s, what happened? Interest rates went way, 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 way up. And money went way, 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 way down. And he lost everything. Everything. He was struggling to try to make ends meet. A friend asked him after several years of him being broke, said, Maxie, do you ever think about the money you gave away? He said, sure I do. But he said, I want you to understand something. The only thing that I didn't lose is what I gave away. Everything I kept, I lost. Now I want you to understand something in life. Whatever you keep, you're going to lose. And whatever you give away, the philosophy of Jesus, you'll keep. Isn't that crazy? Well, wisdom only takes you so far. It's good. But it's not enough. It's not enough. So let me go one step further in Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verse number 5. Let me tell you the restrictions of wisdom. As you do not know what is the way of the wind or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child, so you do not know the works of God who makes everything. There are some restrictions to wisdom. He's saying there are some things you're never going to learn. As Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the dark things belong to God. You're never going to get them. It doesn't matter how much you try to understand them. It's too deep for you. You just simply cannot plumb those depths. So you just need to recognize that I'm not, never going to understand that. Now, some things are just simply buried in the mystery of God. Let me end with a fable today. There was a man wandering in the night, and he was lost. He was so afraid. The, the weather was 
uh, inclement and the rain was coming down and the temperatures were dropping and he was so cold. He was inappropriately dressed for this weather and he was freezing. He thought, surely I'm going to die out here. Nobody knows where I'm at and, and I'll never see another day. And then as he wandered around, he would trip and he would fall and he would get up and he was frightened and then he saw it. Out in the distance, he saw this little light. So he begins to make his way toward the light because light brings hope. And he starts making his way toward the light. And the rain's coming down and the temperatures are dropping and he's shivering and shaking. And he finally comes to this big building. And he recognizes what it is. It's a monastery. And he goes to the door and he, and he knocks and he can hear coming down the hallway of that monastery. That abbot, as he's walking toward that door, and he opens the door, and he says, may I help you? And the man, shivering and shaking, says, I am so cold, and I am lost, and, and I'm afraid. And he said, could I please come in? And the man, the abbot, said, sure, you can come in. And he said, we're, we're about to have our evening meal. Would you like to have something to eat? And the man said, I would be so grateful. So he went in and he sat down at the table and the soup warmed him and the fellowship and the relationship and the conversations were stimulating and encouraging and, and, he, and he enjoyed that. And then the abbot said to him, Sir, the weather is so bad, would you stay the night? And the lost man said, I would love to stay the night, but I need these items. Otherwise, I can't spend the night. And the abbot said, well, sir, what are those items? And the man said, I need a pound of butter. A pound of butter? Okay. He said, I need a rubber pair of rubber pants. Okay. A pound of butter, a pair of rubber pants. He said, I need a poker. A poker? Does he poke a fire with? Okay. We can come up with that. I need a cricket back. Get back. That's going to be tough. Okay. And I need a bass saxophone. So all, 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 all the monks began looking through the, their ha the house and the, and, and the monastery and high and low. And they finally bring these items to this man's room, give them to him. And everyone is just like, what in the world does he want with those items? And out of that room that night, the awful it squeaks and squawks and half notes came but finally it settled day everybody went to sleep woke up the next day the weather was still horrible still raining still cold the abbot said would you stay with us another night he said i will but i need these five items i need a pound of butter a pair of rubber pants poker cricket back in a bass saxophone. They brought the items to the man. And again the same result. Squeaks, squawks, half notes. Finally it all calmed down. Everyone went to sleep. Happened a third night. And then a fourth night. And the fifth day the sun was shining. And they go to breakfast. And, and the man says I want to say how thankful I am for the preservation of my life. Thank you for giving to me and helping me. And the abbot is walking the man to the door. And the abbot said to him, Sir, I'm so interested. Why did you ask for those unusual items? The man said, Well, he said, It's been a family tradition. It started with my great-grandfather, then my grandfather, then my daddy. And now me. And he said, we've never told a single solitary soul. But he looked at the abbot and he said, but because you're a man of your word, I'll tell you. And he did. But because the abbot is a man of his word, you and I will never know. Some things are buried in the mind and heart of God and you and I will never know. For you and I, it simply becomes a matter of faith. 
Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except he come through me. And for you and I, it simply is a command to be obedient to him and follow him regardless if we understand everything or not. We just simply say, yes, Lord. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13 says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Here it is. You want to know what it is? Fear God. Here it is. I told you a couple weeks ago, the secret to life. Here it is. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is man's all. Would you bow your heads, please? Our response to God's grace is, Lord, I don't understand it all, but I trust you and I am going to follow you. Today, I simply want to call out to those who are on the edge that simply need to say, yes, Lord, I've evaluated, I've analyzed, I've thought through, I don't understand all of this, but Father, I believe, help thou my unbelief, I'm going to give my heart to Christ. Some are saying, well, John, you know, I've been thinking about this, analyzing this, and I'm wondering, do I need to be actively involved in becoming a member of First Baptist Church and give my all to Christ there? And, And you're battling back and forth. The answer is take a step of faith, move forward, take the reins of responsibility, and hook up. Others need to simply say, yes, Lord, I give my heart to you. I give my all to you. Father, I follow you. And I will follow you in believer's baptism. Whatever you need to do today, would you be wise? And then would you act in faith? Father in heaven, thy will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand and come.